Today we're going to start module two, right? We're going to start out with viruses. Um, so as we were talking about earlier, some of us that were here earlier, your objectives are your study guides, right? Module one is what Thursday's test is on. We'll talk about where and how we're going to achieve that goal on Thursday in a moment. Um, and then we go over those objectives in the PowerPoints, right? You kind of re-solidify that information doing your Connect assignments, which for Module 1, you should have completed them by now, but if not, right, get working on them. Um, make sure that you really understand the material um, before the test on Thursday. For Module 1, I was having trouble with one of the recordings, and I don't know how many of you guys are actually watching the recordings, but you'll see I have my old ones from spring. I left those still open for you guys, and then this is um, for summer. It apparently had uploaded to my YouTube channel, and I didn't realize it, um, but I thought it hadn't. Um, it, was, it was this one if you were looking for it, but you'll see that I have you know each one of them linked. The other thing is you'll notice I have my own YouTube channel, and if you subscribe to it, every time I upload, even before I post it on this page, you should get some type of announcement if you sign up for alerts or you, know, you guys know about all that kind of stuff. I don't. Right. So some of my past students still watch my YouTube channel. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we really just want to keep going over this stuff over and over again. I'm willing to share. I have a problem with it. Um, so. All right, so as far as the test, and I actually might have still on here from last semester. Let me see. Uh, trying to remember where to go. I haven't made any announcements for you guys yet. That's why it's blocked out. Huh. We'll make a new announcement. So, exam one. Thursday on Module 1 at 6 p.m. Make sure you know your Canvas username, which is your name, so that's pretty easy, right? This is the hard part. And password. Because how many of you guys have your computer remember it for you? So write that sucker down someplace secure if you can't hold it in your brain. Because you're going to need to log on to Canvas, right, as you guys have already experienced to take your test. But because we're still having issues with people having, and I did find out from my IT people, um, Lockdown Browser definitely isn't on any tablets other than iPads. And she tried an iPad and it still didn't work. You got it on your tablet? For real? Yeah. Huh. Sweet. Well? Well, that's cool. Uh, but I think we're still at where some people don't have. So what I went and Ed and already did, so that we weren't stressing again tonight, is that I made um, a reservation at the computer lab in Building 1. So we're going to meet at 6 p.m. and actually I'll be there earlier for office hours. I'll be there around um, 4.30. So um, building one is the really big building at the front of campus, the main big building on City Park Avenue, right? So we're going to go to building one uh, and it is room 108 West in case you're wandering around on the first floor. It is called the Hibernia center. It is a computer lab. Next to, I'm probably going to spell it wrong, Einstein's bagels, if you've been there in building one on the first floor, at the back of the building. No, I think that's, yeah, close enough, right? And she'll have my role sheet 
She's going to stay open late for us. I usually close at 6, but she's going to stay open so we can take our test. Um, and she'll have uh, you guys in her system. And she'll, you'll have an access code, and you'll log in. And she'll tell you how to do that. And then you'll sit down at a computer, and you'll click on the lockdown browser, right, because it's on those computers. It'll take you right to Canvas. You'll log into Canvas. You'll click on the exam. Um, and then I'll come around and she'll come around and we'll put the access code in for you to take the exam. And then when you're done, you'll log out of her check-in computer she has at her front at her front table or desk. And then remember, we can't just leave, right? Uh, we got to come back over here for lecture. And we'll probably resume at about 7.15. Because uh, most of you guys are going to take the test in a matter of 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, I've never had anyone take an entire hour to take my test. Not even students with special needs. So, uh, you either know it or you don't, right? And, and it's just click, 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 cat. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, I'm so happy I don't have to fill out a scan drawing because we'd probably be here all night. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and then the other great thing is the minute you hit the button, y'all, it's going to tell you your score, right? So you'll know instantaneously how you did on the test. Um, so anything I'm leaving out on these instructions, so make sure you know your username and password, your Canvas username, building one. Um, I will be there early. around 4.30 p.m. if you have questions. And I'll even put it here. We will meet in the regular classroom building 207E at 7 p.m. Okay. And so, in case for some reason you come over here, usually what I do is I post a sign that reminds you to go to building one. Oh, that's wiki pages. I have a document that usually says that. But I don't see it. All right. I'll just save it for now. So I had one, at least one more person come in. Was that Makisha? Yeah. Yes. So we're just missing Christy? Okay. Just missing Christy. Okay. So let's see. That's posted for you guys to remind you. So now we can get to the fun stuff. And that didn't take too terribly long. Let's talk about... Oh yeah, so no, absolutely not. Uh, there's no way it's next week. Um, one, because I will not be here, <laughs> which is the other reminder for you guys. Um, so next week, um, we won't have class. Um, instead, you guys are going to be needing to watch my old recordings from last semester. And depending on where we end up, the good news is that stuff is relatively easy stuff. Um, but we will definitely uh, have a real, like, quick review session on what you guys went over on your own. 
You guys are also welcome to meet in here, but there won't be a sub or anything. So if you guys still wanted to meet and like play my recorded lectures on your computer or something like that, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. If you want to do it from the comfort of your home, then you can do that. Um, so yeah, we won't meet here next week because I will be in Connecticut for training. Um, and then we'll come back the following week and I'll do like uh, some type of activity, I think, to try to find out how much you guys learned on your own before we finish up the material and then probably have a test. Um, I might even push it to the next week just to be sure. Yeah, definitely the beginning of the July. Yeah, after the holidays probably. Probably I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm thinking my online's I have it set for July sixth. I probably do the same for you guys. Um, so for test two. Um, next week Tuesday and Thursday. And those of you guys that have me for lab, which is only Annie, <laughs> you're gonna have a substitute. Right, yeah. Because you guys also have lab and a test <laughs> that she'll give you. Sarah is going to sub for me. I subbed for her last year when she was in Paris, so she owes me one. So I'm excited about my trip, though, even though it's not a vacation. Uh, cool. Scientists, you know, we're nerdy like that. We, we get excited about doing science. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Good. So viruses. So we talked briefly about these guys, right, um, in the beginning. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about viruses, but we're also going to add in some other acellular agents. Um, viroids, viceroids, purons or pyrons, or I usually just say infectious proteins because that's a whole lot easier. We're going to talk about the similarities and differences as it applies to the type of nucleic acid they contain, if any, and whether they contain protein, and what type of hosts, what type of cells, or other things do they infect. And we're going to identify the diseases caused by uh, pyrons, at least some of them, anyways. So all of these are non-living elements. So none of them are organized to the cellular level. None of them are a cell. So they're commonly referred to as agents or even infectious agents. They're not organisms because again they're not the basic unit of life. They're not even cells. But they do consist of at least a few, but only a few, molecules that we do find in living cells, right? We have DNA in our cells, right? We have proteins in our cells. These guys are strict, obligate, intracellular parasites. They must get into a cell in order to use that cell's machinery to make copies of itself, to replicate itself. So outside of a host, they're said to be inactive. So when they're not inside of a cell, they're said to be inactive. A lot of times we say we do what to viruses when we're cleaning at home? We kill them. Hmm. Can you kill something that was never alive to begin with? Not really. But that's a term most people understand, right? If you kill it, can it harm you? No. And do you have to worry about viruses harming you? Absolutely. They're infectious, right? They cause disease. They have actually even been linked to some cancers. So do we want to destroy them? Most of the time, absolutely. Like, I don't know a single good virus out there. <laughs> I don't know what to be like, oh yeah, sure, I'll take that. No. <laughs> Not the case. Right? So we want to, you could say, destroy, right? That's another very easy term that most people understand, right? You can say inactivate. Mm, that's a little more technical, right? People might not re really understand. Or render non-infectious. But destroy is the one I like to gravitate towards, right? So again, we use that term because most people understand that term. 
right? Manufacturers of disinfectants and stuff like that say kill, right? Because that makes everybody feel happy, <laughs> right? Exactly, right? But you aren't probably, in fact, if you're a scientist like myself that don't consider them living to begin with, there's no way you could kill them. But we can destroy them, and we can make them non-infectious. So let's first talk about what they're made of. So most of us are aware of viruses, but are you really aware of what they are, right? Down to the molecular level, what are they made out of? Probably not. How many of you guys have actually even heard of viroids? Yeah, not until you probably started reading in your book, right? Viceroids, um, which are sometimes in different texts referred to as satellites, are another funny thing you've probably never heard of before, right? Pyrons or pyrons are infectious proteins you probably have heard of. Anybody think of a disease that they know of that's caused by these infectious proteins? In England, they had a problem with this in the 1990s. We actually stopped importing beef from England because of this disease. Mad cow. Mad cow. So see, you knew. I knew you did. Okay, so we'll talk about that and a couple others. Um, so let's back up. So nucleic acid, do you think viruses have nucleic acid? What is nucleic acid? Give me an example of a nucleic acid. DNA? RNA? Yep. And in fact, viruses have either DNA or, or, or RNA. We haven't had any, found any that are both. So in fact, most scientists, especially virologists that study viruses, will refer to a virus based on whether it's made out of DNA or RNA. They'll say, oh, that's a DNA virus, or that's an RNA virus. So the herpes viruses, DNA viruses. The HIV virus is an RNA virus. So what, right? Is there differences between RNA and DNA? Yeah, yeah. In our cells, we have both, right? Because that flow of information that we're going to talk a little bit more about in genetics typically goes from, what do we start out with? Where is all our information stored? In our DNA right? And then we transcribe that into RNA, more specifically usually messenger RNA, right? Which is then read by the ribosome that's then turned into protein. That's the central dogma of information in our cells, right? DNA, RNA, protein. So DNA and RNA is information, right? Just in different forms read by different molecules by different enzymes. So do viruses have to do things a little bit differently if they are just RNA? Yeah. Where if they're DNA, our cells know what to do with that, right? We can turn DNA into RNA and RNA can be turned into proteins, no problem. When your RNA can run into some problems. Because we don't typically copy RNA in our cells, right? We just transcribe DNA into RNA. We don't just copy RNA. We make RNA from DNA. So that's something to think about as we talk about the processes of how these viruses replicate. How do they make copies of themselves? Viroids are one of these two, RNA or DNA? Which one would you pick? RNA. RNA. And that's all they are, actually. And when we talk about what hosts they infect, you'll understand why you've probably never heard of them. Viceroids or satellites are similar to viroids in that they, too, are just RNA. Where pyrons or pyrons or prions 
or the easy one, infectious proteins, are protein, right? So do they contain any nucleic acid? Nope. No, they're just protein. Viruses. They're DNA or RNA, right? I think that's it? You gotta protect that stuff, don't you? That's precious. Right? In our cells, what do we where do we stick it? Where's our, our DNA and our RNA for the most part? In the nucleus. We put it in two membranes, in a nuclear envelope even. Right? And in a bacteria cell, it's at least encased in a membrane and probably a cell wall for most bacteria. So I mean you have this layer of protection. Viruses are not cells though. But could they use something to protect that nucleic acid? Yeah, what's the most stable molecule out there? Proteins. Viruses at their very core are either DNA or RNA surrounded by what we call a protein coat. Their shell, their protective layer. Now, if I said RNA only, that that's all they are, viroids, do they contain any protein? No. Viceroids are satellites? No. And what are pyrons or prions? Proteins, right? So they're only protein. So we know we could get viruses, right? Who else can get a virus? Animals, which, by the way, guess what? We're animals. <laughs> we just put ourselves on this little pedestal. Okay, so besides animals, who else can get a virus? Plants, yep. Think microscopic. Bacteria, yep. More microscopic. Come on, you guys. In, oh, Annie's the only one. In, no, a couple of you guys are in Sarah's lab. Just not in mine. Would you look at under the microscope? Eukaryotic microscopic organisms. Huh? Well, our care are prokaryotic, but yeah, they can get viruses too. What about eukaryotes? Yeah, what are some microscopic eukaryotes? Yeast. There you go. Keep going. Mold. Fungi or yeast and molds. Protozoa. One more. They can uh, photosynthesize like plants, but they're microscopic. Algae. Cyanobacteria or, of course, bacteria. But yeah, they can get viruses. Any living cell can be infected with a virus. So everything we just named and anything else that's a cell. But we just named the broad categories of most living organisms. So all living organisms. If it's a cell, it can be infected with a virus. But the good news is viruses are relatively picky. Right? Do the viruses that plants get, do we have to worry about getting them? Do we have to worry about the viruses that bacteria get? Do we have to worry about them infecting our cells? No. And this will make sense, too, when we talk about how it is they get into the cell, because they're intercellular parasites, right? Which means they have, and obligate, which means have to get inside of a cell to replicate themselves. So the first step is attaching and getting in. So are all cells the same? No. So that virus is designed to attach to the cell it invades and be able to invade to get inside that cell. And so we're lucky in that animal cells are different from plant cells, right? So only animal viruses infect us and vice versa, right? Plants don't have to worry about the viruses we carry because they're not equipped to get into a plant cell. Because with a plant cell, you get a whole other barrier to breach other than the membrane. you got to get through what? The cell wall. Same thing with bacteria, right? Their viruses have to deal with cell walls. That's a tough barrier to breach, too. 
I got to get creative. So viroids, who do they infect? Plants. And that's why, of course, because you know we're kind of egocentric like that. We usually only think about ourselves. Although if you're a black knight, by the way, can't remember who got that result. Doesn't mean you're selfish. It means you are, like you said, goal-oriented. And that is an awesome trait. And psychology majors will tell you, too, it depends on what mood you're in when you fill out that survey. Because I've gotten two different results pretty consistently. I'm either a dreamer or a shepherd. Right? Depends on whether I'm dreaming, right? Or if I'm in my, you know, control mood, and I might get shepherd. Right? When I'm in teacher mode, I get shepherd. So. But we didn't get any different ones I haven't seen in a while. But there's really cool results like discoverer and scientist and doctor but usually those of you guys in the allied health, it's white knights and black knights, and shepherds and bishops. Did somebody get bishop? I think somebody got bishop. That's another one. And uh, that's another popular one, dreamer. That's another popular one. The ruler? Oh, the benevolent ruler. Yeah, we get a lot of those. Yep. yep. I've read that one several times. Yeah, I don't even read their descriptions anymore because I've literally been doing this for years. I probably have most of those memorized. So I just read what you guys write about it. <laughs> but it was cool to get you guys get to know you guys a little bit better, right? And vice versa, right? So it's pretty cool. So um, moving on to our infectious agents, uh, viceroids are really interesting. Our satellites, these are just RNA, and in fact, you could say they're a parasite of a parasite <laughs> because they actually have been found in how we discovered them is inside viruses. So remember I said viruses are either RNA or DNA. So we've found some DNA viruses that also have RNA in them. And so at one time, and this is why sometimes I ask you guys to read the hepatitis case study before we do viruses, is that um, the hepatitis D what we called hepatitis D, come to find out was the hepatitis B virus with a viceroid in it, with a piece of RNA in it. So that RNA now has been referred to as a viceroid or a satellite because not all hepatitis Bs have it. But hepatitis B can be infected with a viceroid, with a satellite, that we now know as viceroid D, or hepatitis D. The good news with that is that what do we have to protect us against some viruses? What can a doctor give you at a doctor's office that will help protect you? Maybe even make you immune to that virus. Vaccines. Well, because guess where hepatitis D is? inside fire, hepatitis virus B that the hepatitis virus B vaccine protects you against also hepatitis D. Because you need the B in order to get the D because the D is inside of B. It gets kind of confusing with the letters, huh? But as they were going, obviously, as I would, they're discovering these hepatitis, these viruses, of course, the first one became hepatitis A, and then, well, it was probably just called hepatitis, right? And then when we discovered there was another one that causes destruction to your liver, right? That's hence the hepatitis, referring to the liver is inflamed. Anything that ends in itis means inflammation, right? So this was this virus that inflamed the liver, hep, referring to liver. So then they found about hepatitis B, right? So we had to start lettering them. And then now we know there's hepatitis C. And what's the bad news about C? No vaccine. We have a vaccine for A and B, but not C. Hepatitis D is a fact. Hepatitis B with the viceroy D inside of it. So hepatitis B vaccine works for that one. Does the list continue? Yes. There's E. There's G. I think we may even be all the way to I right now. 
Yeah. The good news is those other ones very rare. Uh, I know, for instance, E, other countries, um, and G uh, are really issues in other countries, not in the United States currently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. There is some similarity to the terminology um, in that um, satellites are referring to things associated with other things, like the moon that circles around our Earth is referred to as, as a satellite. So it's called that because of its association with the Earth. Okay. So the satellite, meaning that it kind of takes a ride with the other virus, does that make sense? Yes. Where satellites, again, of DNA are, are different, it has an association like that where it's that relationship of it being associated with something else. I don't know if anybody really understood what we were just talking about, but it's okay if you don't. <laughs> I'm not going to try. Okay, but Annie understands. That's important. Okay, so it, that's where, you know, medical term, right, is a wonderful thing, too. Like I said, itis refers to an inflammation of, right? Most of us know hep refers to the liver. Cardio refers to? The heart, right? It's crazy how some of these terms become everyday knowledge nowadays, too, though, thanks to medical commercials on TV. Um, okay. Infectious proteins, as we said, just that. We've already named one disease, mad cow disease, right? And for the most part, as we know it, um, these are animal only or, or human, but again, remember, we're animals. Um, type of problem that we currently know of and still there's oh, there's a lot of stuff we're still finding out and understanding about infectious proteins um, so this is a really relatively new area of science and as I said probably previously about viruses like the extent of my knowledge is about the extent of this textbook right I don't have a degree in virology that's Marion Friedstadt <laughs> Right? Mine's in immunology, so that when we get to that, like, I could talk forever on that, so I'll warn you now. <laughs> um, this stuff, you know, sometimes you're going to ask me stuff and I'm going to say, I don't know, because I don't. But we could always look it up, right? Um, no, salmonella is a, is a bacteria. Salmonella is a bacteria. It's not a dinosaur. It's another commercial for you, right? Fellow kid's cute, though. Okay, so um, viroids. Um, so they're unable to replicate itself, right? So um, again, just like viruses, they really rely on that cell to copy them. So they believe they may be replicated by uh, a polymerase, an RNA polymerase, right? That means it makes RNA. But this is a special one that it doesn't need DNA to make RNA. So this is an enzyme that can actually attach to the RNA and make more RNA. Now remember, viroids, we talk about what organisms being infected by them plants. So again, this is not something we have to worry about happening in our cells. So they believe it's a, a roll, rolling circle mechanism, which is a similar mechanism to how um, bacteria actually copy their DNA. And they believe why it causes disease, why it causes problems for plants, is they believe it's triggering RNA silencing. So think about this. DNA in our cells is double-stranded, right? What is RNA? Single-stranded. 
And that's important because what reads the RNA to make proteins? Ribosomes. And the way the ribosomes interact with that messenger RNA, it's got to be single-stranded for it to be able to read it. So if you have RNA in your cell, right, and you have another strand of RNA that's also single-stranded, but it's complementary, what does that mean those two strands are going to do? They're going to bind with each other. So then now you have double-stranded RNA. Can the ribosome read that? Nope. So that RNA basically has basically been deleted, right? It's been silenced. The cell cannot read that RNA. It can't turn it into the protein it's supposed to turn it into or translate it into. So would that be a problem if your cell was like making messenger RNA and it thought you were going to make protein out of it and you don't make that protein? Yeah, because you don't make proteins just to make them, right? You make them for a purpose, to do something, right? Most of the enzymatic chemical reactions that happen in your cells are catalyzed by proteins, right? Most of your proteins you produce are enzymes that run all the reactions that happen in your cells. Then you've got some that are structural and some that are somewhat structural and functional like the ones embedded in your membranes, right, that help facilitate the movement of stuff in and out of the cell. Or in the case of the electron transport chain, right, all of those are embedded proteins in a membrane. If you can't make those, you can't survive, right? You can't do electron transport chain in your mitochondria or you're dead. So think about that poor plant cell. What if it's, say, a protein they need in their electron transport chain that's in their chloroplast? Are they going to be able to photosynthesize? Nope. Right? So it can cause debilitation, it can cause disease in that manner. It shuts down processes. So in the biotech program this morning, and I was prepping lab for this week and next week, they got a brand new incubator in. So cool, pretty piece of machinery. They poked their head in the lab, in my lab, they're like, you're the only one in here? I said, yep, it's me. Like, oh, we were looking for Andrew. It's like, no, Andrew's teaching class right now, remember? They're like, oh, we need help moving the incubator. I walked down, I was like, I tried to lift up a corner. I was like, yeah, no, ain't happening. I'll go get Brett and relieve him from his class so he can help you guys move the incubator. But needless to say, this morning when I was eating my cookie, the director of the biotech program was really excited about his new toy and was telling me, because he's the protein guy and I'm not the protein person, I'm the... DNA, RNA, immunology girl, he was saying about how, you know, we bioengineer bacteria, mostly E. coli, to get it to do our bidding for us. And in fact, the insulin, if you have any friends that take insulin, it was made by a bacteria nowadays. We've taught E. coli how to make human insulin. And in fact, we've even tricked it into making a little bit different protein so that it'll stay stable at room temperature and they don't have to carry around coolers with them anymore. How awesome is that? But apparently, you know, does bacteria, does E. coli need to make insulin? Yeah, no. Doesn't need it, right? So when you're getting another organism to do something it doesn't want to do, sometimes you have to try and convince it to do that, like a nine-year-old, right? Convince him to use his timer when he brushes his teeth. You have to tell them things like you have to go back to the dentist and get the tooth bugs removed if you don't do this, <laughs> right? So one of the ways they trick bacteria into doing their bidding for them is to actually grow them. This incubator not only warms, it cools. They can grow them at refrigerator or even freezer temperatures to get them to make the proteins they want them to make because, again, why would he make insulin? He doesn't need it, right? you got to convince him to do that. And one of the ways I do that is actually to grow them under cold conditions. Why that works, I don't know. But that's pretty cool. So, you know, cellular processes, we know a lot about cellular processes. 
right? So, but yet still some of this stuff, I mean, we're talking submicroscopic here, y'all. We're talking about molecules, right? We're talking about DNA and RNA and how there's, there, these interactions are happening in cells. So we have really high-powered equipment like fancy incubators, and mass spectrometers, and PCR machines, right, that allow us to study these things um, in really high-powered microscopes nowadays. But we're still sometimes, you know, we don't know the answers to it all. And, and, and we're continuing to ask these questions and figure out exactly what's going on. So notice again, I, I said, you know, we believe, right? This is the current accepted, widely accepted, made it into your textbook's belief of where we're at. Did I study this when I was sitting in your guys' shoes? Didn't even know about it. Didn't even know about it. Partly because I'm old. But that's because also science is advancing that quickly, too, when it comes to certain things. So they would look something like this, and I apologize, the picture is not wonderful. It's the best I could find stealing from the Internet. Um, but what I really wanted to show you guys here is, is remember, back from biology, I know this might have been a while ago, what is the code that we think of when we think of RNA and DNA? What letters come to your brain? A's and T's and G's and C's and U for for RNA, right? RNA's got U instead of T. These actually stand for something. Adenine, guanine, uracil, cytosine, thymine. These are actually a portion of the molecule even. This is what we call the nitrogenous base that's attached to the sugar, and that's the ribose sugar for RNA. That's why it's called ribonucleic acid. And for DNA, it's a deoxyribo, right? That oxygen, there's an oxygen missing from that ribose sugar. And then you have the phosphate group that binds sugar to phosphate to sugar to phosphate that creates that backbone, right? But off to the side, you have the nitrogenous bases, which we give those letter designations to, which is that's the code, right? That's what makes each molecule different. That's our code, right? So just like computers have binary code, we have code. Our code is A, G, T, and C. And if you're talking about RNA, it's A, U, C, and G. Because of this, too, we know DNA is double-stranded, right? So you've got phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base, phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous bases sticking out, and those bases base pair with each other. Anyone know the, the pairing? Who goes with who? A and T adenine and thymine, and G and C, guanine and cytosine. And how I remember this, thank God they're still around, is A, T, and T, right? Gotta love it, right? And G's and C's kind of look like each other. They're both curved, right? So it kind of makes sense they go together. But molecularly wise, there's a reason why Watson and Crick figured out they went together too. Of course, you know, they kind of pirated Rosalind's, Franklin's work too, but you know. nowadays we give her credit where credit is due for her work that helped them discover the structure of, of DNA. So because of that base pairing, now we said RNA is typically what in our cells though? Single-stranded, right? It doesn't base pair with itself. But what do you see here in this picture? You see it as a circle, right? And you see how there's some portions where it's kind of looped? That's where it's not pairing. Where you have these straight sections is when you, where you have what's referred to as intrastrand binding. Now, this isn't considered double-stranded, though, because it isn't all binding complementary. Does that make sense? And then, of course, when it's doing that silencing, it's actually stretched out. But this is one of the ways that they believe that it... it it maintains its stability and doesn't fall apart inside the cell. So when it's not bonding with another strand, it intrastrand binds with itself and creates this closed loop structure that I'm trying to show you here. This is similar to what you see for transfer RNAs. You guys remember transfer RNAs? They form that kind of T structure. So there's some intrastrand binding that happens with transfer RNAs. I got strange looks at me. I can find one of those pictures real quick on the internet. The 
these guys. Right, so that's single-stranded still, right? But there's some intra-strand binding and it creates these three loops. And again, it probably helps stabilize the molecule. And what do transfer RNAs transfer? Complementary. Nope. They interact with the ribosome. The amino acids, yep. So they have part of their loop down here. Here, let me make it big. Part of their loop down here is the anti-codon. This is the match, the three base match to the code in RNA that we're going to talk about next time in our genetics lecture. At this end, they're carrying the amino acid to the ribosome. So that code in the RNA tells what transfer RNA to bring what amino acid. And then the ribosome sticks the amino acids together. It's all about the code. But this is also interstrand binding, right? Where, you know, and again, it probably creates stability for that molecule. Where messenger RNA is pretty much straight. You don't have interstrand binding because then the ribosome couldn't bind to it and read it. Yeah, they're not binding. So if you can kind of see, I know it's hard to see, where it's straight is where you're having the, the complementary base pairing, and these loops are sections that aren't binding with each other. So that's why they kind of loop out. Similar to what you just saw in the transfer RNAs. So that's about as much as we're going to talk about viroids. In comparison, viceroids, again, are just RNA. And again, single-stranded, but they can form those loops that we just looked at, like you see with viroids. They're still single-stranded, but they can form a loop and have some interstrand base pairing. Unlike thyroids, they do encode for one or more gene products. So this means that that RNA looks like messenger RNA to a cell. A ribosome will bind to it and make a protein from it, or more than one. But at least one gene product can be made from a viceroid or satellite. Typically, they need a helper virus to infect other cells, right? These RNAs all by themselves can't get into other cells. They need a virus to help them get where they need to go. And so this is what I was talking about before. The hepatitis D virus, come to find out, isn't a virus. It's a viceroy. It is an RNA inside the hepatitis B virus, which is a DNA virus. So infectious proteins or prions or prions. Most of us, as we've already found out, right, are aware or remembered about mad cow disease. The scientific name for that, instead of the common name, is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Bovine, of course, is the proper name for a cow. Spongiform is what the brain tends to look like when it's infected with this infectious protein. It becomes um, very spongy because it has a whole bunch of holes in it. Encephalopathy, again, refers to, encephalo refers to the brain, right? So this is a, a, a morphology, a pathology that happens to the brain. And, of course, if your brain deteriorates, you act very strange, and so hence the common name, mad cow disease. Anybody know how it came about? from eating each other. So they thought it would be really great to recycle. 
this recycling was not a good idea. So cows that died, they ground them up into meal and fed them to living cows. The problem with this is that they, that they died from this infectious protein. They didn't know why they died. And they perpetuated the problem by feeding the cows, the infected cows, tissue. It's another, yet another reason why not to become a cannibal. Not to say there aren't 50 million other reasons not to eat people. But in some cultures, they do eat people, right? And there are some beliefs out there that if you eat your ancestors' brains, you will get their memories or wisdom or whatever you call it. You laugh. But because it seems bizarre to us, right? But for other people and cultures and different experiences and different expressions to knowledge, that could very much make sense to them. We know, right, with the education that we have and the lives that we've led, probably not a good idea, especially because of things like mad cow disease, right? That you could get something from doing that, right? Because um, typically they usually don't cook it. But the other scary thing with mad cow disease and with these proteins that we still, like I said, we're just scratching the surface of knowledge with, is that heating does not completely destroy them. You would have to heat them, say, in an autoclave for four hours. Anybody know how long we autoclave our stuff to sterilize it against bacteria and viruses in the microbiology lab? A little longer than that. 15 minutes for stuff that's relatively clean, right? So if it's media that we're pretty sure it isn't contaminated, about 15 minutes. Stuff that we know has large numbers of bacteria growing in it, about a half hour, not four hours, under high pressure steam. So people are like, oh my God, we, we, we've got to sterilize everything for four hours now, right? Do we? No because we pretty much know about these things, and if it has that, then yes. But chances are, does the media that I buy, or that we buy for the microorganisms contain infectious proteins? No. Do the stuff we're growing in microbiology lab contain infectious proteins? God, I hope not. <laughs> right? So we're pretty safe at sticking with our normal protocols. Now, where did this come from, though, right? Like, oh my gosh. So again, we believe um, and I always, I, I might have to cheat and look at my notes because these aren't as common and I didn't write any notes. See, there is a note section, by the way, in PowerPoint. And occasionally I actually write myself little notes. And I didn't for this one. But uh, Scrapey, I think, is in goats or sheep, something like that. And crew actually is another one that occurs in people. And again, usually where they're eating their ancestors or whatever. Uh, Christoph Jacob disease is pretty much the human form of uh, mad cow disease. And same thing could happen there. If you eat somebody who has this, you will get it. But how it arised in the beginning is they believe through a mutation in the DNA, right? So somebody's DNA mutated and so that is what we call uh, the spontaneous mutation, where the virulent is where you've ingested it, right? You've eaten, which again, you don't really in the United States have to worry about this, right? Because you're not going to eat your dead grandmother. The scary thing with these kinds of diseases, as of current, there's no effective treatment. And what they believe is going on is these proteins, they're your own proteins that you normally make in the brain. But when they deform, they actually become enzymatic and they get the other proteins like them to also deform. So you have 
proteins that are supposed to be doing a job in your brain that are no longer doing that job. So that's a problem. And then they convince all their friends to also misbehave. So then you've got massive revolt, right? You've got strike in the brain tissue. Not a good area of the body to be on strike. So eventually, right, it doesn't work anymore and you die. That's the terrifying part, right? We really don't know if we can do anything for you to stop this. The good news is it's rare. And we know how to avoid it, right? England cleaned up their act too with the whole cows eating cows problem. <laughs> and get rid of mad cow disease. All right. Do we want to take a break? Yeah, let's, let's take a break. Come back in 15 minutes. This is a good spot to take a break. <laughs>